Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we'll talk about preventing and treating depression with guests. Michael Pollack, CEO of the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance, and Ricardo Munoz, Distinguished Professor of Clinical Psychology at Palo Alto University and founder of i for health So Michael, Ricardo, thank you so much for joining us. This is such an important topic of discussion in the middle of this pandemic, depression and dis- despair at the best of times, very common in the United States, affecting over 6% of the population. 17.3 million American adults are affected by uh, depression and despair. Michael, can you talk a little bit about what depression and despair is? And Ricardo, if you could also uh, comment, and then we'll get to your organizations and how you deal with, with these issues. But what is depression? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you, Mark, for this invitation and, and hello, everyone. Thanks for participating in a discussion, hopefully, on a really important topic. And Ricardo, it's so great, great to see you. Um, I am not a clinician by training, so I'll I'll leave the clinical definition of depression uh, to Ricardo, but I will just say, I think it's important that we all remember depression is very serious, can be very serious, but it's also a treatable condition. Think about it as a chronic condition Um, with proper treatment. um, Someone can live um, quite well, uh, just like we think of other chronic conditions such as diabetes, Um, very serious, chronic, but also treatable. Uh, Depression really impacts how a person feels, how they think, and sometimes how they act. Um, Symptoms, uh, we often think of sadness um, and perhaps crying, um, but uh, other symptoms can be irritability and agitation, um, but also apathy um, and just um, a lack of motivation um, to really um, live a a fuller life. Um, So that's how I would think about uh, depression, Mark. And it takes a lot of different um, guises, doesn't it, Ricardo? There's no really one res- human response to depression, is there? That's correct. Uh, depression comes in many, many varieties. I mean, the uh, symptoms of depression that, uh, I'm a clinical psychologist, by the way. So uh, I founded a depression clinic at San Francisco General Hospital in 1985, which is still running these days. Um, and uh, the, the symptoms of depression include depression itself, of course, inability to feel pleasure in things that you used to enjoy, uh, appetite increase or decrease, uh, sleep, either sleeping too much or, or not being able to sleep, changes in how you move. Uh, some people move really slow when they're depressed and some people are very agitated. Tiredness, uh, fatigue, not having energy. That's one of the most common symptoms. Um, and f- some people feel worthless sinful, guilty, uh, trouble concentrating, and the probably the most dangerous one is thinking a lot about death, wanting to die, and beginning to have thoughts of suicide and even attempting suicide. Of course, that's the most dangerous symptom. Uh, people say they feel helpless, hopeless when they are depressed. Um, and we think that some of the things that trigger depression um, in terms of life events are reduction in things that give life meaning and pleasure. And the pandemic, of course, has done that, right? I mean, we can't get together with our friends. We can't go to work or to school, all those things, or stressful events uh, such as the pandemic. So when you you take that and you extend that into bipolar disorder, you have an even uh, more extreme layer in which uh, uh, periods of uh, very elevated mood are punctuated by uh, very depressed mood. Uh, Michael, could you just give us uh, more texture on on that part of of the uh, of the picture of of mental health and how it intersects with um, with the world of depression? Sure. So, a person who lives um, with bipolar um, may experience uh, the symptoms of depression that I talked about and that Ricardo um, spoke um, extensively about, um, and oftentimes an individual will also have periods of um, what we call mania, um, um, feeling um, kind of um, euphoric, if you will, and um, uh, uh, feeling really good about um, the direction of their life and and the activities in it and feeling like they can pretty much conquer the world. Um, 
um, those feelings um, can create a sense of um, of normalcy, quote unquote, in their life. But at times it can uh, be extended to um, making decisions that may not be in one's best interest. Sadly, often um, followed by um, kind of a drop or a crash in emotion. Um, I have members of my own family who live with bipolar and I've, um, I've seen this um, on a personal level, on a family level. And of course, in, in my role here at the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance. Um, but again, it's, it's treatable. Um, it's important, I think we're gonna hopefully talk about this later, that if, if we're talking about depression, if we're talking about bipolar and we're encouraging others to um, educate themselves for, the, uh, for either their own life or the people in their lives, um, the more likely those individuals will be to get the support and help and treatment that's available. One of the things that I think is so difficult about mental health is that there are no physical signs that one can see um, immediately available. In other words, if somebody is, is ill from a virus, you can see the flushed faces and you can, you can see the trouble breathing. If somebody breaks an arm or, or, or uh, sprains an ankle, they're limping. But people, all of us have at times uh, mental health ups and downs but we don't really visual, visually uh, manifest uh, many of those symptoms. Uh, Ricardo, how do you um, counsel um, individuals to recognize symptoms in themselves and recognize symptoms in others that could, through early intervention, be treated? You know, actually, uh, some of the symptoms are visible, right? I mean, the facial expression, for example, uh, people start speaking differently. They may speak very little or very low tones. There are some symptoms that you can tell. You can tell when somebody's depressed uh, and certainly when somebody's manic, uh, at times you can really see it. Uh, so um, I think uh, one of the issues that we should be thinking about is how to recognize changes in mood that begin to lead toward a clinical uh, episode. Right? All of us have ups and downs. I mean, that's part of being human. In fact, depression or anxiety can be very useful, like pain can be useful, right? Pain helps you to protect your body when you put your hand on something hot. You know, the pain helps you move the hands and you protect it. In some ways, anxiety and depression also are signals to you that something is going on in your life, that there's something that, uh, that's threatening you and you feel anxiety or something that's affecting the, the feeling of life, the, the meaningfulness of your life. Um, and so once you start having those symptoms, um, monitoring those like you would with blood pressure, for example, you know, which at first has no terrible impact, but if it keeps getting worse, it can really lead to bad, but bad effects on your physical health. Similarly, depression can be the same thing. So monitoring your mood, being aware when your mood is starting to go down and trying to do something before it reaches a clinical episode. So what you're saying is, and we, we got a question, can, can depression be temporary and due to circumstances? And well, how, how does that manifest? The, the implication is, can temporary depression lead to a permanent uh, issue? Um, and also, can, uh, can one proactively um, work together to ameliorate the, the, uh, the impact of depression? Uh, what is your answer to that? Can can a, first of all can can a temporary um, stress lead to a permanent issue? Yes, it can uh, actually. Um, you know that that's uh, something that, that gives uh, me hope in terms of uh, uh, dealing with the the terrible impact of depression in our communities. Uh, back in 1984, the National Institute of Mental Health published a report that said, in general, the onset of a clinical depression cannot be prevented. This is 1984. In 1994, 2009, and 2019, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine published reports in which they reviewed the evidence for whether mental disorders could be prevented. And by now, we know that some of those disorders, including depression, can in fact be prevented. And the problem we're having is that uh, right now, insurance companies and so on only pay for treatment. 
But uh, in 2019, just two years ago, the US Preventive Services Task Force published a report in which they said that uh, depression during pregnancy and postpartum can now be prevented. And I'm hoping that that will begin to provide resources so that we can in fact prevent depression in addition to treating it. So I think this is something that we can begin doing now. And Michael, your organization has an even steeper hill to climb because the, this whole idea of, of early intervention and uh, prevention is so critical. Um, we've all had people in our lives who have uh, dealt with bipolar uh, type conditions. Um, we had a very uh, a good family friend who ended up uh, taking her own life um, and was afflicted by, by, the, uh, by the issue. Um, how does the, um, the uh, Depression and Bipolar uh, Support Alliance uh, uh, take a cut of this issue of proactive treatment before symptoms become, uh, get out of hand? Yeah. So our mission is to provide hope and help um, as well as support um, for people living with mood disorders, depression, bipolar. Um, so at, at DBSA, we really take, um, have the kind of the fundamental belief that a person um, can recover from um, symptoms and experiences with depression and bipolar. They can go on to live um, lives where not just are their symptoms mitigated, but they can have full and enriching lives. They can finish school. They can have a full career. They can have people in their lives um, the kind of relationships that um, we can sometimes take for granted, um, marriage, children, um, extended friends and family. Um, we're in this period now, this pandemic, where there's been a lot published around, um, around individuals who've never had uh, symptoms or experiences with depression before, um, experiencing it for the first time. Um, and some of the um, the treatment options, if you will, that we would um, offer to somebody with a diagnosis would apply to those individuals as well. Um, taking advantage of good, just overall health and wellness um, approaches, uh, sleep, exercise, diet, m minimizing uh, alcohol and drugs, um, and then finding the right treatment for, um, for each individual. Uh, that could be seeing a therapist or a psychologist. It could be medication. It could be attending a support group um, to engage with people that are going through something similar who can, um, you can relate to and where, you, th frankly, the stigma would feel a lot less. Um, so there's a lot of uh, paths to wellness and um, proactively, some of them we should all be practicing regardless of, of our mental health as a preventative method. But when we are having those feelings, um, there are different um, options available. And um, the biggest uh, encouragement I would offer is we have to be talking about them. That's why I was very grateful, Mark, for, that you're addressing this topic and the opportunity um, to have this conversation. We need to make this more talkable um, so that people feel comfortable getting the help they need. You just completed a poll, Michael, in which um... 69% of respondents said that they had experienced depression and despair in their lives. And I'm sure that number uh, today is larger than it would have been a year ago before the pandemic hit. Um, when, when you talk about the first step being communication, um, how do we overcome the stigma that we feel, the, the, the fact that uh, we might feel vulnerable and, and weak and exposed by admitting that, you know, sometimes we feel what might be called down, uh, might, might be given uh, uh, the name of debilitating uh, depression. Um, how do we get over that? How do we help others to get over it? Um, Ricardo, when you are, are setting up your clinics, how do people start off the conversation? Well, in our case at San Francisco General Hospital, when we started the clinic, we worked with primary care patients. Um, one of the uh, problems uh, with depression 
is that often people are not aware that they're having something that's treatable. And sometimes, especially when we began the clinic back in 1985, uh, primary care physicians do not recognize it, or if they do, they avoid talking about it because sometimes patients uh, get angry at them for suggesting that they may have a psychological problem. And so they avoid it. Uh, another reason they avoid it sometimes is because they have nowhere to send people. There are many places where there are no therapists available. So the physician feels like if I tell this person and you have something and then I can't do anything for you, what's the point of telling them? So right, and insurance often doesn't cover it. Exactly. So I think uh, all of those things make it very difficult. Uh, so uh, learning to, to um, recognize that depression is real. It, it's not, you know, it's not all in your head. I mean, it's really a, something that affects your whole body. Uh, it affects your life. Uh, I think as Michael mentioned, um, when people have trouble with their mood, and it doesn't have to be a, a clinical depression. It could be uh, what's called sub-threshold depression, which means depression, some symptoms of depression uh, that don't reach quite the, the criteria of major depression. People uh, are more likely to start smoking. They have a harder time quitting. And when they quit, they are more likely to relapse. The same thing with alcohol, drug abuse. Depression has an impact on tons of, uh, of uh, things in our life. Uh, the way we treat our family uh, is affected by depression, certainly by, by uh, bipolar illness. Um, and um, one of the things that I'm very concerned about is uh, depression during pregnancy and postpartum because it, it makes it difficult for the mother to be able to enjoy the baby and to bond with the baby, which also, of course, then has impact on the baby. So I think we need to, to begin to recognize that this is something, again, like high blood pressure. We didn't used to think of high blood pressure. Now, you know, everybody understands it's not a stigma. You, you, you get your pressure taken, and if it gets too high, you need to do something about it. You know, lifestyle changes or medication. The same thing should be true for depression. I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the line between uh, medication and self-medication. Uh, we have a tendency when we come under stress to, fit, to, to respond in certain ways. And one of the ways that we respond is to self-medicate. And the self-medication can be by eating too much, or it could be eating too little, or it could be ingesting alcohol, something to dull the pain or uh, maybe we, we take painkillers, or maybe we become um, involved with, with opiates. Uh, maybe we smoke some, some, uh, some marijuana in some way that we're trying to treat ourselves, but that could spin out of control. Michael, how do you look at that line mm -hmm. between self-treatment you know, and being empowered in, in that way, and then perhaps taking that a step too far and then having that become a real issue in your life that that can accentuate these conditions. Yeah. You know, I think for me, addressing stigma is a big part of this, Mark. Um, there's so much shame, unfortunately, that still exists around feeling depressed, um, feeling anxious, um, where people won't come forward they won't share with their friends, they won't share um, with their employer um, or with members of their church or their friends. Um, and so they're living with this experience in silence. And so then we're, how do they manage that? Well, because we don't talk about it as a society, um, we're not equipping individuals with um, the right tools to get the right form of treatment that would be better for them. And I think that that's often why uh, individuals turn inward and, and they overeat, they drink too much, they turn to illicit drugs or smoking. Um, the more we can talk about this and make it comfortable for others to, to think of uh, depression or some other mental health condition, the way they would look at um, heart disease or diabetes, where they would go and they would um, educate themselves and they would seek out treatment and they would get support from friends and family. Putting those structures around um, ourselves when, it, uh, when the situation involves our mental health um, are really important so that individuals recognize what they're dealing with is not something to be ashamed of and, and something where there's resources out there available to them. Maybe we have to look start looking at mental health uh, exercising 
in the same way we look at physical health exercising, right? A combination of diet and physical movement can, could that be translated into how we view uh, mental health, Ricardo, if we take the stigma away and we just say, hey, we're, we're all living in a chemical soup, right? We all are affected. And, and, and actually this is not to be stigmatized at all. It's just that sometimes we feel really bad. And at that time, we probably need a little bit of help. You know, following up on that, I, I've mentioned being mindful of your mood. Of course, you know, that's, that's really important. But then what do you do when you start feeling somewhat depressed? First, identifying the thoughts and the activities that improve your mood and that worsen it. Uh, just becoming aware of these things. This is what we And do giving with- yourself permission, right? To, to do the thing that improves your mood, right? Yes. Yeah. One thing that we teach in our depression prevention uh, interventions is that at any moment in time, you have three choices. You can think or do something that will improve your mood, leave it as is, or make it worse. Throughout the day, you're making these choices. Now, we don't expect anybody to always make the perfect choice, right? We're not perfect. Uh, in fact, trying to be perfect can actually lead to depression. <laughs> so, but just being aware that there are things that you are thinking and doing that affect your mood. That's one, one, one thing. One other thing that I suggest is uh, this idea of the healthy management of reality. I mean, what what you've been talking about here is that you start feeling uh, depressed and you start using drugs, so you start you know engaging in in behaviors that are really counterproductive, uh, risky behaviors, for example, to try to distract yourself. Right? There's a way of managing your, your reality, your personal reality that is healthy and ways that are unhealthy, like again, abusing drugs. Um, so learning the healthy management of your reality is important and practicing the presence of good in those around you and yourself, right? Increase, try to increase the good that radiates from you and from those around you. And you know, to, to, to bring more of a sense of good in the world, especially now that we're all suffering from the pandemic. You know, call your friends that you haven't talked to in months, perhaps, you know, call them on the phone, do Zoom if you have access to Zoom. You know, uh, you, you can actually get together out in, in the, on the beach as long as you, you know, stay apart and wear your masks. You don't have to be alone. You don't have to be alone. These are the kinds of things that would be exercising for mental health. And there's so many aspects of this that, that, are, that have been tried and true approaches through human history, right? I mean, if you look at religions and creating congregations and self-support groups and groups in which uh, people meditate together and recite poems together in the form of prayer, right? Th- these are not new techniques. We, d- we, we had taken a poll in which we tried to uh, ask people uh, where the biggest problem was with depression, and we, we segmented by uh, age, uh, uh, children, young adults, um, youth, I'm sorry, uh, children, uh, youth, young adults, um, uh, uh, adults, and then uh, seniors. And we found a, a real blip uh, amongst uh, youth and young adults. Um, how do you see, see this? And, and is this, does this actually give us a roadmap of trying to integrate recognition of trauma and depression and mental health in the early stages of education so that by the time people uh, 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 become youth and enter into adults that they are equipped by our educational system uh, to really recognize and treat in the same way we do that for, for diet or drug abuse or, or other conditions? Do we have an education challenge here to get people to the point where as they enter adulthood, they're more equipped, Michael? Yeah, um, you're spot on, Mark. And um, you know, there was a re- earlier this week, there was a, a global mental health report that came out that looked at um, the mental health crisis across um, a number of English speaking countries, U- the US being one of them. And um, the age group uh, most impacted um, uh, adversely uh, are young adults 18 to 24, I believe. Um, and that's what we're seeing at uh, DBSA. Um, we have started to offer um, resources as um, for kids as young as age four, um, age four to 10, for parents, for caregivers, for teachers, for guidance counselors and therapists. 
to encourage children to identify the different moods that they're experiencing, particularly during this pandemic. Um, everything from sadness and loneliness to anger to excitement um, to make um, to give them opportunities in um, age-appropriate ways to talk about and identify and manage those feelings. I think long-term, that's the that's the age we really need to be starting with, so that it's not this um, kind of silent experience that um, children um, go through and enter adulthood not having the tools um, and not feeling equipped. Um, with, with teens, um, how do we ensure that there are ways that teens can um, approach an adult or even approach other teens in a supportive environment to, to get what they need? So as they become young adults, um, they feel like this is something that um, they can identify just like they would a broken leg um, or something like that and know that they need to go see someone to help um, get them on that road to recovery. And then Ricardo, there are other ways to look at this. We, we segmented it by, by age, but you had mentioned before the show started so, a, a program that you're involved in to uh, approach um, uh, Native American communities, Latin Hispanic communities, African American communities. And it is incontrovertible that the pandemic has really placed much more stress on communities of color um, and certain, uh, certain communities based in income um, than in others. Could you just describe um, the program that you were discussing with me and, and, and how you see um, the, the disparate impact um, of, on, on Americans uh, across this, this country? Yeah, the program is called SEAL, the National Institute of Health, C-E-A-L, that focuses on disparities that are affecting uh, Black, Latinx, uh, American Indian communities, particularly. But, you know, I'm, I'm realizing that we're getting close to the end of the time. And I just wanted to offer an, uh, a, a resource that people could use. Um, if you Google Silicon Valley's digital apothecary, you will reach a website that uh, we have at Palo Alto University that has some. Uh, resources that are online, self-help resources to focus on mood control. One is called Better Bet, which stands for behaviors, uh, emotions, and thoughts. And another one to, uh, it's an online uh, intervention to prevent postpartum depression. Um, and uh, uh, we also have uh, uh, a couple of other things, including some webinars on how to uh, try to prevent depression during the pandemic. Again, so Silicon Valley's digital apothecary and all of those things are available at no charge why don't we do this um at the end of this uh let's let's the three of us chat and let's uh get a whole series of resources and we'll send it out to everybody who uh, registered for the webinar and we'll also uh, put that out in social media how does that sound Ricardo? terrific so um michael we're going to give you uh the last word um in terms of of uh helping someone to um to uh, that, that is, that is uh, the impediments uh, to have someone seek help. Um, we just took a poll in which we I identified the two biggest impediments as being money, the cost, and stigma. Stigma being the, the greatest impediment. Um, do you feel that, that those two are the biggest impediments and how do we deal with, uh, with those issues? And as a matter of fact, we'll, we'll come back to Ricardo as well, since Michael, you started and we'll give my, uh, Ricardo the last word, but is it money and stigma? Um, is it communication um, and destigmatization that is uh, a, a key part of this, uh, of dealing with this issue? It's a really big issue. We haven't been equipped um, to address and talk about mental health in our society. Um, I, was, I was recently asked um, by employers, what could they do for their workforce? And you know, my feedback to them was train your supervisors on how to talk about mental health. Supervisors have the most direct engagement with workers on a regular basis. That's where the most trusting relationship exists. And, um, but we don't train them the way we would train them in other um, um, skills and, and parts of the job. 
Um, many employers will offer first aid training, but they don't offer mental health first aid training. So those are just some, some ways to address stigma, at least in the workplace. And in terms of um, cost, there are a lot of free resources out there, but let's just face it, even before this pandemic, um, this country has not invested in mental health and all of those warts are showing up right now. We need mental health parity. Um, insurance companies need to be providing the same level of care and reimbursement for mental health as they would for any other ailment. Um, and, we've, and that's part of the advocacy work uh, that still lies ahead of us. And Ricardo, what is your answer to the same question? How do we, what are the first steps that we need to take as a society? I'm not talking about treatment, but I'm talking about how we need to think about this problem. Yeah, I again would like to refer everyone listening to a report that the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine just put out in 2019. It's titled Fostering Healthy Mental, Emotional and Behavioral Development in Children and Youth. It's a wonderful report. It suggests that we should have a decade of youth uh, in the US. Uh, people should know that depression or mood problems in general begin around puberty. That's when you get the biggest increase. So 12, 13 years of age, girls experience it mainly as depression. Boys have depression, but they also get involved with substance abuse and risky behavior and things like that, much more than girls do. But anyway, that's when it's happening. And now that we're all stuck in our homes with our children, uh, I think we need to be paying attention to our children's state of mind. Be more kind to your children, you know, pay attention to what they need. You're going through a lot of stress yourself, I know, but, you know, pay attention to your kids. Actually doing that, helping other people can often help yourself. So that's what I would recommend. Yeah, I think that it comes down to talking about it, being a friend, listening, listening, and, and just being aware right? We, we, we just need to come together and try to be mutually supportive, but no time is this more important than during this pandemic. I'd like to thank you both for sharing your, your great knowledge, your great wisdom. Michael Pollack, CEO of the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance, Ricardo Munoz, Distinguished Professor of Clinical Psychology at Palo Alto University and founder of i 4 Health. We will uh, include some links in our social media um, and uh, help direct those who are in need to, uh, to various resources. Thank you all for attending. Thank uh, attendees for your questions and everybody stay safe. That's the nonprofit report for today, Tuesday. Come on Thursday again. And Michael, Ricardo, thank you so much for, for helping us understand these, these conditions. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark.